My name is Terry Sutherland. I work for the Center for International Forestry Research, which is based in Bogor. We're an international organization uh, which has our global headquarters here. We work throughout the tropics, and my particular emphasis is, is mostly West Africa and South, e South Asia. I work very little in Indonesia, which is a, a strange anomaly by actually living here. Um, but I'm going to share some work that we're, we're doing and have done on forest trees and nutrition, which has some implications for forestry here in Indonesia. But just uh, as I was invited to give this talk, I was trying to think, you know, am I a nerd? Am I, am I the kind of nerd that, that Jenna's just sort of presented on the, on the stage there? The person that sort of has band-aids around their glasses and wears dodgy uh, t-shirts. Apparently my t-shirt that I arrived in was so dodgy my wife bought this one from a place down the road because uh, it was far less nerdy. So clearly I have elements of nerdiness and I actually found something online which is a bit of a nerd test. So if you find these jokes funnily, apparently you are a nerd. Um, and I actually found a whole list of 30 or 40 of these jokes, and I was actually in hysterics in my office. So uh, I think the, uh, the, the nerdism is definitely there. <clears throat> so let me share some aspects of being a forestry researcher. I've been working in forestry research uh, across the tropics for around about 25-ish years. Uh, yeah, quite a while. My first sojourn was in Panama, and I met one of these chaps, a brown recluse spider. And there I am, age 19, a very young, geeky nerd with a very swollen finger that was nearly chopped off by the American Marines in whose hospital I resided. 1996, I had a tree fall on me in Cameroon. It sounds very funny. I know when you're a forester that you have a tree fall on you, ha, ha, ha. This put me in hospital for three months, and I was on traction for another three months. So a bit of a, um, an experience, a forestry dynamics experience, as we used to say. Of course, working in the tropics, working in the forest, you get a number of parasites. I've had malaria lots of times, um, bilharzia, onchocerasis, which is river blindness, and I've been poked and prodded by various medical students around the world wanting to see all these wonderful um, diseases and how they manifest themselves in human beings. Um, I've had many accidents in the forest. This is un an unfortunate one, using a crossbow trying to fire uh, a line into a, a tree to, to climb up into the tree to collect flowers. Um, and that just sums pretty much up my accident proneness, of which I'm, I do have some uh, repute. Um, living and working in the forest, all of those uh, here who do that uh, tend to eat things we'd ra rather not. And this is smoked bushmeat in Nigeria, uh, which has been carried out of the forest um, for a few days and smoked. And you often have to bang the maggots out before you can actually eat the, the, the meat. And who's ever going to complain about Jakarta's roads again? This is a, uh, a familiar site in much of the forest areas we work in. And this is an old Land Rover I had for many, many years. Um, never really usually got stuck, but uh, this is a particularly bad day. Um, as I say, you can't complain about Jakarta's roads. But working in the tropics, we do see some fabulous sites. This is Mbeli Bay in uh, Central Africa, which has the highest concentrations of forest elephants in these wonderful salt lick areas. And I was standing on a, uh, a podium for a, f a couple of days with a woman who'd standard, stood on that podium for 17 years counting these elephants. So the dedication of many forest researchers is, is quite remarkable. Meeting wonderful people. Um, I've got thousands of these types of pictures of areas where we've worked in with different types of people. And last but not least, I met my wife working in the forest. Jackie, smile and wave. Um, so uh, lots of benefits and ups and downs of working in, in the forest. So let's get serious about some of the, the issues I want to talk about uh, and highlight today. Um, the idea that, that we're, we're trying to promote here in many respects is the evolution of agriculture and forestry and how, and how agriculture and forestry uh, fit together. As our uh, primal ancestors, ancestors crept out of the forest and the savannas and found that a few nuts and seeds would actually grow when planted, Agriculture, particularly in the, in the Middle East, became uh, the real source of civilization. It began about 12,000 years ago. But over the centuries, we've used many, many, many thousands of plants and animals for our nutrition, for our health, for our medicines. But over the last um, hundred odd years, we've basically simplified our diets significantly. We, we've, we've cut down on the diversity of our diets, so the biodiversity that provided much of the value of the forest, if you like, has been uh, narrowed in such a way 
that we have what's called a diet simplification. And today, only 12 plant crops and only 14 animal, domestic animal species provide 98% of the world's food. And that's a pretty shocking statistic when you consider we have 250,000 species of plant uh, extant in the world. And only three crops provide more than 50% of the calorific uh, energy of our current food system. That's a pretty narrow genetic base, and we've lost a lot of our agrobiodiversity because of it. So what are the effects of, of um, this diet simplification? So in many respects, those of us wake up in the morning, we're very fortunate here, we wake up to a possible feast, and many people wake up to a famine. There's a huge inequity in our food distribution systems, and I'll just explain that a little bit more. So essentially, we still have, in 2015, more than 800 people undernourished and 200 million children that are underweight. More than a billion people are classified as hungry, and this is, these are data that come from the Food and Agricultural Organization that were published last year. Yet we have one billion people who are obese, and that obesity leads to non-communicable diseases like diabetes, heart disease, diseases that are starting to become much more common in countries like Indonesia, and even in developing countries in West Africa uh, and Latin America, where you would traditionally not think of overconsumption uh, contributing towards bad diets. This monoculture and the simplification of diets has also contributed to um, vulnerability to climate change events, uh, particularly related to pest and diseases, uh, droughts, uh, and other uh, climate uh, issues, but also market forces. Uh, it's something I'll touch on a little bit more in a, in a latter slide. And sadly, 40% of the food actually grown is wasted. 50% <clears throat> of food uh, is lost in post-harvest, and up to 30% uh, is lost because you and I will probably buy a nice salad in Hero, and after three or four days, if we haven't eaten it, it goes straight in the bin. And this is a huge uh, problem, uh, and there's a, a very, very, um, I should, should say, commendable campaign in the UK at the moment to, to stop uh, food waste, and the, the large supermarket conglomerates have bought into this, this uh, new scheme, and we can touch on that again uh, in the discussion session if, if necessary. So in short, our food systems, our global food systems, are not functioning in the way they should do. They're not providing a balanced diet for many people, and they're providing an over-consumptive uh, diet for, for many others. Um, and it's essentially, we've, we've not only homogenized our culture, if you, if you look at any high street in Indonesia or in any, any country in the world, we have a homogenized culture, there's Starbucks, there's um, KFC, McDonald's. So that, and, our culture of homogenization has also led to this homogenization, homogenization of nature, if you like, so this very simplification of um, our diets. And of course, there are some, some major culprits. Um, the, the large agriculture and conglomerates often get blamed for these issues, and if there's anybody from Monsanto here, there's no finger pointing, it's just the only cartoon I could find uh, to illustrate this point. Um, and you know, there's a lot of concern that the future of food is basically about genetic modification, technology. I was at a workshop recently in Zambia where we're talking about injecting um, sweet potato with vitamin A and spending millions of dollars doing so. I don't quite get that. If you want vitamin A, you actually just go to the forest and harvest a few leafy vegetables. Why spend millions of dollars on, on uh, uh, fortification of vitamin A uh, in, in uh, in uh, sweet potato, and they're doing the same for, for maize and also um, uh, sweet potato, is that sweet potato? Um, maize and cassava, cassava is the other crop. Again, cassava I'll touch on uh, in a latter slide. But our food systems are not only dysfunctional because of the inequity and, and the, the calorific um, uh, emphasis and, and on our food system and, and the lack of nutrition in many respects, but there are some geopolitical issues as well. And this is an interesting slide which shows food price spikes correlated with, uh, with periods of social unrest. And particularly here, we have the, the Arab Spring um, from 2008 to, to 2010. Large areas of, of political unrest occurred because people couldn't afford basic foodstuffs. And there are some strong linkages between the geopolitical aspects of food production and our simplification of diets. And again, I'll talk about that in a, in a latter slide. So forests, this is what, what I do, this is what my colleague at the back there does, Migresh, hi Migresh, um, thanks for coming. Um, we basically are looking at why forests are important for, for food and, and livelihood issues. Um, 
And there's some great figures out there, some great stats, which are starting to provide a really strong evidence base as to why forests are important for food security, nutrition, and livelihoods. And there's a, a wonderful study last year published by the United Nations uh, Forum on Forest, which actually show that one billion people, that's one-seventh of the world, rely in some way on forests for their, their nutrition, food, medicines, or livelihoods, and, and direct income. One-fifth of rural income is derived from the environment, so we undertook a, a very extensive global survey coordinated by C4, um, 38 different countries, 8,000 households, and found the average household derived at least one-fifth of its income from the environment, and actually outstripped in many respects income from agriculture. Wild harvested meat is a contentious issue, uh, but bushmeat, in particular in Central Africa and in Latin America, provides significant proportion, uh, proportion of protein intake for many rural communities and is extremely important for a balanced diet. And there have been some interesting discussions on replacing uh, this bushmeat source. And in Central Africa, the, if I, I must get this right, it's something like 700 tons of bushmeat are consumed each year in the Congo Basin. To replace that with livestock, you would need to clear two million hectares of forest to grow cattle to be able to replace that meat source. So these are interesting conundrums in our food systems that we need, that also need to be taken into account. 75% of the world's population still rely on medicinal plants, um, not only because of culture, but because of, of economic uh, need and necessity. And 60% of the f global fruit production does not come from large fields of wheat, cane, barley and everything else. It comes from diverse smallholder systems, primarily um, uh, at the uh, purview of women. Uh, women play an incredibly important role in these smallholder agricultural systems. Up to 80% in, in Africa and 60% in Asia um, of these smallholder farmers are, are women. And th these are extremely important in terms of the resilience of food systems. Basically growing many different crops in a smaller area is a great, um, uh, how do you call it, a um, uh, defense against climate change. Adapt and it, uh, people are able to adapt, not putting all your eggs into one basket enables you to, to diversify and make sure that you'll at least at the end of the year have some crops which have survived a particular climate uh, issue. And we have a long tradition of managing forests for food. Sweden agriculture, slash and burn agriculture, which has long been um, thought of as a negative thing, is actually a very positive way of managing forest for food. The fallow systems are important, um, but also it links very clearly with this, uh, this issue of diversity with our food systems within the forest uh, ecosystem. So what do forests give us? Um, they give us all the things we, we quite like, chocolate. Chocolate comes essentially from a very small area of, of uh, Central and South America, but is now pervasive throughout the tropics. It's a multi-million dollar market, and I'm sure most people here have, like chocolate to some degree. Uh, other crops, such as uh, coffee. Coffee has a very interesting um, uh, history. It, uh, the ancestral um, root of coffee is two or three valleys in southern Ethiopia, um, and from there this huge uh, industry has developed. And people I work with cannot function without their first coffee of the day. Like, Don't speak to me until I've had my first coffee. Well, it's an interesting addiction uh, resulting from what, we, what is essentially a, a very minor, but very common bean. Rattan. Rattan is something which is very common in Indonesia and Southeast Asia, a little bit in Africa. I did my PhD on rattan in, in, in Africa. Rattan's worth up to $6.5 billion a year. This is no small crop. Um, and uh, it's very important in terms of understanding the, the con production to cons the consumption system that there's a very, very strong um, and equitable revenue sharing uh, aspect to the, to the rattan industry. So people make money all the way along the trade, which is why it's extremely profitable. People eat insects in many parts of the world. <coughs> this, this is, uh, these are insects which are seasonal in Central Africa, um, and these are eaten uh, as soon as they fall to the ground. In Thailand, uh, up to, uh, I think, 11,000 tons of insects are processed each year, and you can buy tins of processed um, caterpillars and, and uh, grasshoppers uh, in the markets all throughout Thailand, and these are being mooted as a potential new food source uh, for the wider 
um, uh, society. Bushmi, I mentioned, is extremely important. Um, despite the ethical considerations of bushmeat, the nutritional value is extremely important, or, or even more important, I think. Many, many medicines come from uh, rainforest plants and, and trees. Uh, I'll touch on, on one uh, in a subsequent slide. But um, the pharmaceutical industry has relied significantly on, on novel chemicals from rainforest trees. Unfortunately, as the pharmaceutical industry becomes more and more regulated, the actual system of, of identifying and producing and marketing these crops becomes uh, products rather becomes extremely expensive so there's less emphasis on looking for novel um, medicines in the, in the tropical rainforests charcoal and other fuel wood cannot be un overestimated at all up to 80 percent of the world's uh, fuel wood is used to um, make water drinkable so you can imagine if we didn't have fuel wood and people were drinking um, water that was unclean, the incidences of waterborne diseases would be that much more than they already are. Um, and without um, fuel and energy to be able to cook your food, most of it would be unpalatable. So a lot, again, there's a very negative impact uh, and perception of, of fuel wood and its importance um, in, in terms of forest sustainability, but it plays an incredibly important role in the health and nutrition of, of uh, many, many millions of people. And here's our old favorite, oil palm. Um, rainforests, uh, this is from the ancestral forests of West Africa and it's spread throughout the, uh, throughout the tropics, particularly in, in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Um, but the oils and the resins produced by this, uh, this wonderful palm are actually incredibly important and, and widely used in its native range. Um, and as we've seen, has a, has a strong global market value. Clean water, watershed protection, um, and the provision of clean water is extremely important and an, and an amazing role for forests. There are compensatory schemes um, to ensure that watersheds are protected um, and to be able to provide clean water. And there's an excellent example in Gunung Halimun um, where uh, Danone is paying for the protection of that watershed to make sure that the, the Jakarta um, catchment area has access to clean water. And we're all familiar with the tankers that go up and down the, the, ja the Jaguari every day bringing clean water from that area into the city. And unfortunately, there are other um, things that emerge from the forest, and we all know that most of you will recognize this is Ebola. Many uh, communicable diseases um, have increased, or the incidences of, of communicable di diseases have increased as forests have disappeared. I, I didn't have time to go into this in much detail, but there's some, some very nice graphs that show the correlation of deforestation with the increase of malaria, uh, Ebola uh, and other communicable diseases from, uh, from the tropical forests. But forest and nutrition, this is something that we at C4 have been working on in, in great detail and have undertaken a very um, extensive survey of um, nutrition and tree relationships in Africa, focusing on USAID's um, demographic health survey data. And these data show that there is a strong uh, relationship between tree cover and dietary diversity. So what that means is people who live in closer proximity to forests and trees have a better diet, have a broader diet and a much more nutritious diet, and independent of poverty. And this is a very powerful message. And I presented this, uh, these results, the initial scientific results, to a meeting in Zambia to a bunch of nutritionists within our own agricultural world. And I was stopped halfway through and someone said, wait, 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 you have data to show that trees and nutrition have a strong relation, there's a correlation basically. And they said, we don't even have that for agriculture. So there's this disconnect in, in many respects in our, our food system, as I said earlier, that it, it beggars belief that we focus on calories in terms of food security, but not in terms of nutrition. And, and I think that this relationship between forest and nutrition and dietary diversity has, has sent a very powerful message to the, the, the donor community in particular, and we're you know, glad to be the recipients of some of that that donor largesse, but also it shows that there are, there are stronger and much more nuanced relationships between forests, agriculture, and food security. So we did the same analysis for Indonesia, and we find exactly the same relationship, despite completely different agrarian systems, despite the fact that the culture is completely different, that the rice um, culture here is much more um, prevalent than anything else in Africa. But the relationship is the same. The proximity to forests and trees, people have better nutrition.
but there are some um, complexities. Um, we found some interesting uh, dynamics here. Maybe people can help out in the question and answer session. So, <laughs> proximity to forests and trees, no problem. It's a, it's a black and white issue. Better diet, area diversity, better nutrition. Move to a plantation area. Move to a plantation area, and you have the same issue, even though there are no um, forests and trees there. Move to an oil palm plantation, and dietary diversity and nutrition are extremely poor. So we're not quite sure what that correlation is. So we have a couple of students out in the field trying to understand what that is. Um, but it looks like in oil palm plantations where you have disposable income, people will rely less on forest products or forest fruits and will actually use that disposable income to buy usually Indomie or other um, uh, products. And we had a very interesting uh, meeting in Forest Asia uh, in Jakarta earlier this year where this, this, this phenomenon was termed as the, in oops, sorry, going backwards, the Indomieization of rural societies so that people are relying on, on uh, Indomie rather than their traditional foods uh, in many respects. But that will be interesting to, d to discuss and explore a little bit further uh, this evening if possible. But one thing that's always fascinated me is that we have all these medicines and fruits and trees uh, and resins and everything else from the rainforest. But how did we ever bloody discover them? I mean, think about cassava. Cassava is actually a very interesting product. Cassava is, is, is a native of South America, but it's actually racked full of prussic acid, which is cyanide. And cyanide will kill you. Now, you have to process cassava in so many ways to get rid of that prussic acid, get rid of that cyanide so that it's palatable. But how do you do that? I mean, did our ancestors sit there and, and sort of do this uh, um, trial and error approach? I mean, is it, you know, your turn, you go ahead and uh, you taste this one. And I mean, how much trial and error was there? And I've actually worked in the field who d believe that it's divinity, that it's divine guidance that has allowed people to test these medicines. But I've, I've, I've no, ex no explanation for it at all, but I just find it absolutely fascinating that we have these medicines for the rainforest that have the most tr ex extraordinary uses and that c products such as cassava, which are calorie poor, full of cyanide, have become a global staple. So it is, it is a very interesting uh, ancestral history to much of our agricultural uh, systems. And I, I wanted to do more of these, but this is one really cool example of a, of a product that I've been working on for cent in Central Africa for, for a number of years. Um, and does anybody here suffer from erectile dysfunction? Now, I, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to ask that, but it, anyway, this is a, a plant that, that has the, exactly the same effect as Viagra. And it's managed traditionally by, by uh, uh, pygmies in Central Africa, and they have these very complex s management systems which are uh, Plants are harvested on a rotational basis. They're, they're, they avoid the logging and the destructive practices that often occur in these concession areas. Um, these are, are breaking down, as you can see. This is in a logging concession where um, pows in astali, or yohimbi as it's called, is felled and stripped for the, for, the, uh, for the bark. And the bark is then processed into this uh, um, uh, product called yohimbi. But it just shows how important the integrated management systems are. And, and again, I'd like to sh have shown a few more examples, but obviously time um, is, uh, is against me. But one thing that we wanted to emphasize is that w we live in a changing world. And um, one of the things uh, that I um, have picked up in the last week or so, I was at a conference in Oxford, and uh, somebody um, presented a slide very similar to this. And I thought this would be quite nice to use to actually copy and cheat, actually. but. Um, but it's very, very interesting that, that, that we, we, we the, a typical person, as defined by National Geographic, this is a melange, I think, of, of every single person in the world, consumes around 2.1 hectares of the Earth's resources. And 7 billion of us actually consume up to 14.7 billion. I actually did the maths, and it is quite right. But our global current, uh, current global capacity is 11 billion hectares per year. So we have what is essentially an ecological deficit. Now, we make that up for technology, with technology. So, you know, our high yielding rice, uh, our uh, ability to, to manage the environment in such a way that we don't 
exacerbate that ecological deficit, if that makes sense. Um, but essentially, we're consuming more than 1.3 Earths a year. But how long is that sustainable? And one of the major issues is, uh, well, Indonesia is a classic example. Um, there's some data here that shows forest cover loss versus oil palm production. The expansion of and draining of, of peat swamps and the planting of acacia mangium. Burning of re residual forests, particularly uh, um, on peatlands. And here you see, the very, it's very difficult to see actually, but this is southern Sumatra, this is Borneo. And as such, Indonesia is the, is the third largest greenhouse gas emitter, emitter uh, anywhere in the world. Um, and so these contributions to climate change, these changing paradigms in terms of um, future sustainable development are extremely important. Um, and there are, there's a great paper published last week which actually shows uh, very strong data that we're all going to be experiencing some sort of change in climate we're in wherever we live by 2050. In um, 90, where are we now? 2015, I hate to say I'm 47. In 2050, I'm going to be 82. So this isn't a problem for your kids or your grandkids. This is a problem now. This is a problem that we need to think about now. And with this uh, lovely picture here, uh, and the, uh, showing the longevity of our current generations, we, need, we don't need to be shrugging off these issues. We don't need to be thinking about what's going to be happening in the future. We need to think about what we can do now to avert these kind of situations. So uh, uh, last couple of slides. One of the, going back to food security, one of the biggest impacts of climate change is we're going to see um, at the northern latitudes much more productivity in terms of agriculture. So if we move to Canada and some areas of the northern United States, northern Europe, including Scandinavia and, and particularly the UK, Russia and China, we're going to be seeing huge uh, increases in crop production because of the, the changing climates. The, the guys that are going to be suffering in Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, and even Australia, which is also a, a, a strong agriculture producer. So much of the tropics is going to be re reliant on these temperate systems for food produ products. So essentially, we need to be nice to the Canadians. We've got to be nice to the Russians. We've got to be nice to the Chinese. And especially the folks from Northern Europe, those guys in Scandinavia, they've probably got it all wrapped up anyway. But be nice to the Brits as well. Because we're going to be producing the food that's going to be coming to the tropics in the future. So it's in, in summary, I mean, the challenges of future sustainable development are really related to population growth and gender inequity, two sides of the same coin in many respects. Again, I, as I mentioned, I was at the workshop in Oxford last week. And people, there was a very, very um, polarized discussion about uh, population growth, that it wasn't important, that it was important. Um, but the, the, the underpinning of that was gender equity and making sure that women have a choice about population. And the, again, as, as I say, these, these two issues are very much interlinked. Issues of climate change, food inequity, which I've mentioned, the issue of globalization, the homogenization of culture and nature, um, and, and the overconsumption of, uh, of the planet's resources, and from our perspective, the continued forest and biodiversity loss that we're, we're continuing to experience. But it's not all bad, I think. It's 2014 actually has been a very positive year in, from the forestry perspective. Um, the new sustainable development goals that are replacing the millennium development goals, ineffective though they may have, may have been, I have now stretched out and reached out in, to include forests much more specifically than, than previously. There was a New York Declaration on Forests and Agriculture, not quite linking the two together, but the Declaration on Forests actually committed zero deforestation, and more than 120 companies signed up to this declaration. Monitoring it is going to be difficult, but I reread it this afternoon, and I was fascinated to see the types of companies. It's not just oil palm companies or logging companies, it's fashion houses, it's food, uh, food uh, production, Heinz, all kinds of companies that you wouldn't think would, would be um, thinking about zero deforestation. So that they, there is a, ch a paradigm shift. The, the, the world is changing into a, to a much better um, understanding of the importance of our natural environment, and they're willing to take those green accounting procedures uh, to heart and, uh, and to, 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 uh, to, to case. 
And fundamentally, we're not talking about forests or agriculture or other land uses. We're talking about landscapes. And these landscapes, everything is interconnected. Um, and the silo mentality that has, that has characterized um, much of the development communities' activities in the last 30 to 40 years, agriculture on one side, forestry on the other, and never the twain shall meet, has proved to be unsustainable and unrealistic. Um, and I think that the last two or three years, we've seen this great paradigm shift towards much more integrated approaches um, in land use patterns, and no less so than Indonesia. And I think some of the legislation here in this country is much more forward thinking than in many others in terms of integrated land use and land use planning and the decentralization process. And just finally, a quote from Albert Einstein, so we've always got to finish with a quote from Albert Einstein. Um, but it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a useful one because it actually gives us nerds uh, something to, to, th to think about in terms of don't just watch, but try and do something. And I hope that the presentation that I've been able to put together um, at least shows that there is progress, there is, uh, the world is changing, and we need to think more about how we as individuals can change it as well. Thank you very much. Okay, we have some options for question sessions. We can do them all at the end or do them right now. So let's start by doing them right now. And we'll see if there are any questions, and if not, we can go back to it later in the end. But does anyone have any comments or questions or observations for Terry? I know it's late. So I, I, my question out of uh, sort of personal interest is you talked a bit about edible um, insects in, in Africa um, and in Thailand. Uh, do, you, do you know anything about that industry in Indonesia? How popular is it here and, and whether or not it's being explored here? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> but maybe someone in the audience does, I'm sure. Is there a history of a culture of eating insects here in Indonesia? Yeah. Yeah. Ada yang mau menjelaskan mungkin nanti bisa dibantu. <laughs> I'm not very sure about the uh, eating insects, but I think uh, in Java, yeah, I think yeah, people eat uh, what is laron in English, yeah, laron. So you know, after the rain, then you have the alar. Yeah, the flying one. Yeah, yeah. I think they will, you know, cook it and eat it. I think it's good. <laughs> and so I was told one time that there's a, an insect market where you can buy edible insects up in Glodok. Has anyone been there or seen that? Can they verify it? it looks like a no. Okay, any other questions or comments? Otherwise, we can go to break and just do a question session later. If you, uh, ada yang mau bertanya nanti kalau misalnya mau pakai bahasa Indonesia nanti bisa saya bantu translate. If you guys have any questions and you would like to say it in bahasa, I will help to translate it. Papa. Uh, oh. We also have a question back there, Eric. No, I just was uh, wondering if you could give a little bit more information about your comment that slash and burn agriculture is actually a good thing. I know that uh, recently there's been evidence that it hasn't been the driver of deforestation that we thought it was for many years, but you know, to say it's a good thing, um, it, you know, I'd just like to hear what you meant by that comment. I guess uh, it's probably a reaction to the, the, the such strong negativity about slash and burn agriculture or Sweden agriculture. The general perception is that because you're clearing forests and burning uh, the residue, that it has uh, <coughs> an in, in, infinite um, negative effect, but in fact it doesn't. And long-term research has shown, particularly in Laos uh, and other countries, and there was a global uh, um, review of uh, slash and burn agriculture, I think published about three years ago, which showed on the whole um, 
the impacts on forests were actually limited compared to permanent agriculture simply because of the shifting nature. And of course there are issues of, of population and short of fallows and all of that. But my, I guess my point is the, because slash and burn agriculture is so deeply rooted in history and the, the complex management systems for food that that's sort of driven plays that link between um, uh, forests and agriculture. And I think what, what the message, the strong message that comes from our work is isn't, forests and trees are never going to be able to provide global food security, but neither is our existing agricultural system. You need the two together. And what, unfortunately, is the system now is it you've got the silo mentality and you've got the world thinking in a very linear fashion, and it's very logical. But in, by 2050, we're going to have, what, 9 billion people on Earth. Those 9 billion people are going to be fed. The traditional way of feeding people is to grow as many calories as possible. Um, but as we've seen, our food systems don't necessarily, are uh, not conducive to that. The other thing I, I wanted to touch on, but again didn't have time, was the role of forests in, in uh, ecosystem services. And we've just done a very neat systematic review looking at how forests contribute to agriculture. Not only um, small scale agriculture, but also large scale agriculture. So if you think of pollination services, for example, if you get, take coffee farms, extensive coffee farms in Brazil and Costa Rica, yields drop off significantly away from forests because of two things. One, poll the pollinators live in the forest and they don't come out too far to, to do the pollination. Um, and also climate regulation. And we're finding exactly the same trend with oil palm. So this is, this is going to be a big game changer in Indonesia, I think, because we're developing a data set that is essentially looking at yields across uh, oil palm estates and their proximity to forests and how, what is the role of those forest fragments within that, that oil palm system. And I don't think it's about, it's, it, pollination is going to play a role, but the, what we're hearing from some of the estate managers is that it's water and climate regulation. You get too many fluctuations in temperature the further away you get from the forests and the forests play that very important regulatory role. So there are all these kind of dynamics, and they, they're almost linked to the slash and burn model, even though you know, the, the scale you know, spatially is, 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 is very different, and temporally, of course. But I hope that answers your, your question. OK, any other questions? OK, we have one more back there. Great. Uh, how sustainable do you think consuming insect is? How sustainable is consumed? Very apparently. Um, there was a, I hate to say it, this sounds really nerdy, but there was a food security and insects meeting in Rome last year. And, and the general consensus was I came up with this big declaration that um, uh, insect farming or insect harvesting was probably the most sustainable source of protein uh, of, of any uh, fish or bushmeat or any other source of protein. So it seems to be very sustainable. Terry, I actually have two questions. When you mentioned about indomization, do you also found that there is a, a worse uh, food trend from having healthy snacks at home, mother selling it, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning in Indonesia? I've done some research in several parts of Indonesia, and I found when I live with the households that the mother and the daughter got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. They make uh, healthy snacks, and the daughter sell it. The mother also sell it so that the children can actually go to school with those snacks, snacks money. The reason why I'm as actually asking you this, I'm, I'm working for the past president's office for a reality check approach methodology. And we found that with that, it's actually causing a much more poverty, lot worse than before, because with that kind of money, let's, 10,000s, it can actually fit the whole family, but now the children has to take the 10,000s just to buy for the snacks. Do you also look at the, uh, Maybe I'm, I'm taking a different level, but do you also look at the uh, connections between the dietary consumptions, the healthy food habits, and also the policies that are being encouraged by the government, both at the national and local level, to encourage better and healthy food consumptions rather than having those food trends being encouraged by having snacks and, and indomization? That's, that's more of a comment than a question, and I think that's, that's fascinating. Uh, I think it sounds like we need to talk to you because the, these are some of the, the sort of knowledge gaps that we have. That there's been some speculation that because of transmigration, you get pockets of 
of, of Javanese in, in Sumatra or Kalimantan who have an emphasis on a much more uh, protein-rich diet, and so there, there isn't the same level of undernutrition in these particular communities. Yet, in communities that are um, more indigenous in, in Kalimantan and Sumatra that are focusing on the, the oil palm uh, production systems, because of that extra money in the pocket, instead of cooking those healthy snacks, they'll actually just go out and buy um, uh, Indomie. And it was a great expression at the, at the Forest Asia meeting because it was six to seven hundred people in the room and uh, the lady who, who um, uh, coined the term got a, a standing ovation because it, it was an innovative way to think about the shifting diets and this dietary transition. And um, there, there was a previous researcher who worked at CIFL called Patrice Levang and he did some very, really excellent work on, on um, the Punan, on, on those that moved to the city and those that stayed um, in uh, the forest and their economic and nutritional uh, circumstances. And he found that those that stayed in the forests, they were poor for sure, but they maintained a level of nutrition and food security that those in the city had lost. And they were p potentially more wealthy, they had access to, to the cash economy, but their diets were terrible, there were high instances of, of uh, alcoholism um, and, and other issues. And so the, the title of his paper was Out of the Forest, Out of Poverty, question mark. And it's a different kind of poverty. So all these complexities are, are fascinating, I think. And, and how we draw up policy recommendations based on these subtleties and nuances, if you like, is a, a huge challenge. But that's a, these are good examples. Thank if you. If you have time, I would like to speak to you on this because we're actually looking at other organizations and research that can actually back our reports so that the vice presidents wouldn't be resistant on and receiving our reports and policy paper. Thank you, Terry. That sounds great.